what kind of crowds will gather, but you're all here because you already know the man I'm about to introduce. I'm, I'm sure he always draws a phenomenal crowd for us. Today, we're pleased to host stage historian, Mr. Bill O'Neill. You're still stage historian. I am. Right? A little bit longer. Six years. He keeps thinking that he's going to get to hand that over, but they don't won't let him. And we're glad. <laughs> Mr. O'Neill taught for Panola College for over 30 years, and one of the most distinguished honors he received during that time was he was named a Piper Professor in 2000. That's a really big deal in the education world, um, so we always want to include that, and he's very modest, but, but we like to sing his praises. Today, we're pleased that he's allowed us to help launch two of his newest books, John Chisholm, Frontier Cattle King, and Frontier Forts of Texas, do you know right off the top of your head how many this makes now? No, I know it's getting close to 50. I thought it was around 48 last time I counted. So, Mr. O'Neill is past president and fellow of the East Texas Historical Association, as well as recipient of that association's Ralph W. Steen and the Best of East Texas Awards. He's also a member of the Western Writers of America organization. And if you're not familiar, he's also written many books on baseball and several other topics as well. So we could probably put him in a lot of different writers' organizations. Mr. O'Neill is frequently a public speaker, and you've probably enjoyed his documentaries. He's been featured on the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, TBS, the A&E Channel, and TNN. Please help me welcome Mr. Bill O'Neill. Thank you, Christy. Thank you very much. Um, I was, uh, you know, as you know, this is National Library Week, and uh, I got to be involved in a, in, a, in a library event yesterday in commerce, and so this is two days in a row, first two days of National Library Week, and I'm, I'm very pleased that y'all joined us here for this. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I've uh, had 40 some odd books published, and I've never had two come out at the same time. <laughs> two different publishers, and it was just a crazy coincidence. And it, uh, it, of course, I was very pleased that that happened. Uh, one of them, the uh, Frontier Forts, is a subject very dear to my heart. Um, we, uh, Charles, you may remember, we went to some of those forts on that traveling Texas history thing, and um, and uh, Texas, I started going to these frontier forts back uh, in the 1960s. My first teaching slash coaching job was out in the hill country and I was close enough, I was close enough to be able to go sample some of those things. I'm a ghost town freak. I, I did a, uh, a ghost town, a, a really nice, uh, uh, big pictorial uh, ghost town book one time. And uh, those forts are military ghost towns. And Texas had more of them than anybody else. And it finally occurred to me, after I've been staying in the store in a couple of years, uh, golly, I'm, I'm out here all the time. I need to start shooting these things for, for a book. And I talked to Arcadia Publishers, and they said, sure, we've, I've, I think this is my sixth book for them. And uh, they said, great, let's do it. And, uh, and so I just kept going out and shooting photos of these deals. And uh, had a great time doing it, and I even even went to a couple I never had been to before. The reason Texas had more forts than any other state is because we had more trouble with hostile Comanches and Kiowas and so forth than any other state. Um, I did a book a long time ago called Fighting Men of the Indian Wars, and uh, I did a really serious study. I worked on it for three years, and I found 846 combats between. Uh, Settlers are the military and Indians, 846. The next closest state or territory was Arizona Territory, and they had 400, a little bit over four. Next closest was New Mexico with 300. We had twice as many and more than any other state in the union. So of course, there were a lot of military forts in Texas, and I even traced it back to the Spanish Presidios and so forth, and I had a great time doing that. Uh, there were 61 medals of honor earned by um, uh, soldiers in Texas after the Civil War. Uh, prior to the Civil War, there were all kinds of, uh, of uh, young officers, lieutenants and, and uh, captains and so forth who became Civil War generals later. And it was fun for me to, to, to trace them. And um, as I say, there are 206 images 
in that book. And uh, Shay Joins, the newest member of the library staff, helped me do something about all those images. I took them, but I didn't know what to do with them after that, the way they do it now. You used to send hard copies in, but they don't, they don't do it that way anymore. You know, they did digital stuff, and I hadn't the faintest idea what I was doing. So thank you very much, Shay, for your, 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 your expertise with this book. I surely did enjoy it. I uh, um, just mentioned one other thing about that, about that Ford book. Um, we, we, we kept moving west, or the west would go, the settlers would pass them, they'd have to build some more forts and another line of forts and so forth. Uh, they did not fortify these forts. There were no blockhouses, there were no walls, stockades. They didn't want to cramp up behind walls. They wanted to uh, have a little military town out in the middle of nowhere. And that's, that's exactly what they did because they knew that Indians weren't going to attack a place with, you know, a hundred soldiers in it except the exception that proves the rule. In 1867, right before, right around Christmas time, in 1867, there was a fort way out in Southwest Texas. Uh, if you know Ozona, Texas, if you've gone through there, at least on the way headed west or something in south of there, and uh, Fort Lancaster was, a, uh, it was, was on the stagecoach uh, trail. And it was just a two company post and they were down to one company and it was under strength. They had 40 guys there and the Indians figured it out. And so one morning when the uh, detail was taken, the watering detail was taking the horses down to the nearby stream to water them, about 400 Indians jumped them and they killed three or four of those guys, three I believe. And the other guys grabbed the horses and got them back to the fort, which is unfortified, remember? And so uh, the officers called those guys out and fortunately for them, they were armed with spencer carbines. And it looked a lot like this. This is not an, not an anything. It's something I bought from my classes a long time ago. And if you want to hurt somebody, you have to hit them over the head with it. It's not, <laughs> it won't shoot, it won't do anything. But it looks about right. Uh, it, it actually is a replica, a cheap replica of an old uh, shark's buffalo gun, a carbine. But it has many of the features in appearance that the Spencer did. And the Spencer had a tube that fit into the into the butt of the gun and it had seven slugs in it. And the lever, unlike a Winchester, which you grab here, the lever was the trigger guard, like that. And it was, uh, you could fire that thing seven times. And then when you got through firing it, all you had to do was they had, the, the soldiers carried the thing on a big old belt across their shoulder and it had a thing like an Indian quiver. And it had, it had 10 of these seven shot magazines in it. All you had to do was pull this one out and put this one in and you reload it. And it was really, you know, it was really an excellent gun. It was the best. And these guys happened to be armed with those guns. And the officers lined them up in a semicircle on the parade ground. And they had, the Indians had already grabbed some of the, some of the buildings at the perimeter of the fort and these guys began to march ahead and they were using these things. And 40 guys fought off 400 warriors. And that's the only time that a Texas Ford ever got uh, attacked. And, uh, and they couldn't pull it off that time. So, so there's lots of stuff about, about that kind of thing in this book. And uh, I was very pleased that they would let me do that, that thing on a, on a long favorite subject of mine. The other subject is a biography of John Chisholm, but I don't know if you realize it, John Chisholm was in East Texas. He was raised in Paris, stayed in Paris until he was 30 years of age and commenced his ranching career, and he's buried there today. And he's one of the greatest of all uh, pioneer cattlemen. His uh, full name was John Simpson Chisholm. But when he was a boy, he was called Cow John because of his affinity for cattle on his grandfather's Tennessee plantation. After becoming an overrange rancher, Chisholm was plagued by rustlers, so he developed a distinctive and unmistakably recognizable earmark known as Jingle Bob. So Chisholm began to be called Jingle Bob John and Jingle Bob Chisholm, as his herd grew to vast numbers. He became known as the Jingle Bob King. A genial and prominent man, Chisholm was affectionately called Uncle John. Uh, then there were those who were not so affectionate, told him called him Old Chisholm, but I don't think they were called. <laughs> <to his face. laughs> you know, with his great New Mexico ranch, 
stretching 200 miles along the Pecos River. Now envision a 200 mile long ranch. You know how far that is? That is from right here to Fort Worth, Texas. And that's how long his ranch was, was from here to Fort Worth. And, um, and uh, his cattle holdings ranged from about 60,000 to 80,000 head, and he became known as the cattle king of the Pecos, the stock king of New Mexico, the cattle king of the West, and most regal of all, the cattle king of America. Uh, John Chisholm was destined to become cow country royal. He began ranching at the dawn of the ranch cattle industry in Texas. Within a few years, his cattle were numbered in the tens of thousands. And within a few more years, he owned more cattle than any other single individual in America. His jingle bob herds were the only cattle in the West known by an earmark rather than by a famous brand. Chisholm was a true pioneer. He sought open range grants farther and farther and still farther to the west throughout his 30 year career. His last ranch was the biggest. He built a headquarters complex worthy of a frontier cattle king. He relished the role of cattle bear, serving as a gracious, generous host to one and all. During three decades on a succession of frontier ranches, Chisholm endured Indian raids, stock thievery, drought, financial reverses, and the murderous conflict known as the Lincoln County War. He met every challenge head on. If he caught rustlers, he hanged them. Uh, he took losses of money and even of entire herds just in stride, and then he forged ahead without complaint. Once, according to legend, uh, Chisholm faced down a lethal threat from Billy the Kid during the Lincoln County War. He had courage, a taste for adventure. He had a shrewd head for business, obviously, and he operated his risky frontier profession on an absolutely enormous scale. And after 30 spectacular years as a Western rancher, Chisholm died at 60, just as his beloved open range, which he helped to usher in, just as the open range was being closed by barbed wire. But John Chisholm has never been forgotten in the world of ranching. I found that out in, in, in a year of research going around. He's well remembered. This future cattle king was born in 1824 in Hardman County in Western Tennessee. His parents were Claiborne and Lucinda Chisholm and he was greeted by a two-year-old sister, Nancy. Nancy and John were joined by three brothers. They were all born in Hardeman County. Uh, uh, James was born in 1827, Jeff two years later, and uh, Pitzer in 1834. And I mentioned those three younger brothers simply because uh, they all, all three wound up involved in this cattle operation. In fact, Pitzer, the youngest brother of all, became kind of his right-hand man. As Claiborne's four sons grew, they were expected to help with the countless chores at their daddy's farm and at their grandfather's plantation. So John developed a great love and I, I think a need for outdoor life as well as a feel for the rhythms of agriculture and an understanding of livestock that produced that nickname, Cow John. <laughs> uh, during the first year of the Texas Republic, 1837, Claiborne Chisholm and his family joined a parade of fellow Tennesseans in migrating to the Lone Star Republic. Think about it, just the previous year, Davy Crockett, one of the most famous of all Tennesseans, had been killed in Alamo, along with several other Tennesseans. And then, even more famous than Crockett, <laughs> uh, former governor of Tennessee, Sam Houston, was president of the Texas Republic right then. John Chisholm was 13 when, that, when the family took that trek to Texas, and he never forgot the adventure of moving to a new frontier. The frontier got into his blood. Well, they settled in what became Lamar County in Northeast Texas. Wasn't organized yet. Claiborne Chisholm rode with volunteers against Indian raiders. And I mentioned that, I mentioned that, that incident for a reason. Come back to it in just a second. Uh, Claiborne developed a large farm, helped to build the first brick courthouse in Texas. Well, his oldest son worked for him. And he worked on his daddy's farm, worked on that courthouse. He started clerking in stores. Although wages were low and so were profit margins, but while he did not see his future, in running a store. He was very ambitious. He didn't see enough profit in that. Nevertheless, he applied what he learned as a clerk to a series of ranch supply stores throughout his career as a frontier cattleman, and those ranch supply stores would be part of his business model, as it turned out. Uh, he tried politics. He was elected county clerk, two-year term when he was 28. Boy, he soured on that real quick. He's an outdoor <laughs> guy, you know, and uh, having the duty. And he made his deputy clerk do all the copying <laughs> and everything. And you can still see a lot of his handwritten stuff and his signatures and stuff up in Paris. During these years, uh, John Chisholm began buying steers and selling them to butchers in Paris and other 
new communities around, the business was profitable. And as Chisholm began to see possibilities in an occupation that was congenial to his nature, in 1854, he met a guy named Stephen K. Fowler of New Orleans. Fowler had money to invest in the fledgling range cattle industry. He didn't know anything about cows, but he, could, he saw an opportunity. And by now, Chisholm had learned where he could purchase animals cheaply and where he could uh, graze a herd. So with Fowler's capital, he bought stock cattle at $6 a head with calves thrown in. Chisholm and a hired crew of drovers trailed a herd of 1,200 animals uh, north from Colorado County to open range in Denton and Tarrant counties. That's the land, that's the area where his daddy had helped chase Indians around. He said, no one lives there, it's great, lots of grass. Told his son about it, and that's where Chisholm would lie. Soon Chisholm found an incredible deal, and he was really good at this kind of thing. This is one of the best deals I've ever read about him pulling off. He bought a thousand head of cattle for two thousand dollars, two dollars a head. And and furthermore, he talked the guy into delivering the herd to his ranch. Mm -hmm. And so he he was good at that part. He, and he bought cattle anytime he had a chance to buy cattle, he bought more cows. He didn't care what they were like, he mm -hmm. just bought them. And the census of 1860, at that point he hadn't been in business for about six years, uh, recorded Chisholm Fowler cattle valued at $50,000. His cattle at that point grazed as far southwest, the outskirts of Fort Worth, and took the way to the north of his range. Remember, he didn't own any range, he just appropriated it. To, to, the, to the northwest of his range uh, were 11,000 sheep. You know, sheep have two payoffs a year. One of them's lamb crop, and the other one's the, the wolf limb unlike cows. So John Chisholm reasoned that the uh, most profitable approach to frontier ranching was uh, grazing on open range. And I mentioned his business model a minute ago, that's his business model. From that point on, uh, he, he thought, hey, there's no financial expenditure for land. I don't have to buy anything except for a small plot for ranch headquarters. Cattle were cheap, as you've seen, grazing was free. Drovers were paid on about $30 a month. Reproduction on the range would provide herd increase. Uh, my goodness, he had herd increase, as we'll, as we'll see. It's just unwritten, no expense. If attractive markets were found, and he was confident they would, profits would be immense. Of course, there were risks. And during his career, Chisholm uh, experienced all of the risks. But he was confident of his prospects. He was willing to accept the risk. Here's the deal with him. He found himself to be a risk-taking entrepreneur during a wide open entrepreneurial age in America. The basic economic policy of the government was laissez-faire to leave alone, and the free enterprise system was given full reign. Businessmen were unregulated, and taxes were low, and as a cattleman slash entrepreneur, at just the right place and time, John Chisholm would thrive, and he did. The 220 acres that he acquired for his um, Denton County headquarters featured a hill overlooking to the east, a stream called Clear Creek, and it's beautiful. It is on a gorgeous location, and um, they called, he, he built a frame house there, and they called it the Great White House, and that house lasted until just a, several years ago. And then somebody built the house, I mean, there's a fence around it, somebody built the house right there on those foundations, they built it on a white limestone. So there's still a great white house sitting right there on this spectacular location. And it the, the location attracted attention and the sociable chisholm, he responded to the role of host. For the rest of his life, his ranch home, whether it be there in Denton County for a decade or at two locations later in New Mexico territory, his ranch house would regularly offer hospitality to travelers and to other guests. The final ranch home he built in New Mexico featured an outsized dining table. He, in his dining room, he had a dining table assembled that seated over 20 people. And, and, and then he had a nearby building uh, erected for dances. He just, he, he was a party guy. Uh, <laughs> never did marry him, but boy, he liked parties and everything. In Denton County, Chisholm began using a long rail brand. That, I've got this on the, on the handout, you can see the long rail brand right beside him, and they put that on the left flank from shoulder to hip. And uh, the long rail became one of the most famous brands in the West, but even more famous, as I mentioned, was that earmark that Chisholm devised while ranching in Denton County. He would, you know, cow's ears kind of stick straight out. And he would get, he'd work this out himself. And he'd get his pocket knife and he'd slid it in right above 
right beyond the root of the ear. And then he'd go out like this. And when he did that, when he cut the ear in effect in half, uh, the lower half just dangled. And it looks like a jingle bob. Let me get a little bit closer. The jingle bob is a, that little trinket right there. And cowboys like to put them on their spurs. And you can see if I turn this thing up sideways, you can see it looks kind of like that ear. And uh, uh, like that. And so uh, the cowboys call these trinkets jingle bobs, so he called his cows. Uh, everybody started calling his cows jingle bobs. And uh, so it, it is inhumane. If, if you did it a little bit wrong, well, that bottom part drop off. Uh, and if it froze, and it often does, sometimes those things would freeze off. And rustlers sometimes would just cut it off and steal the cows, and they'd register a lob ear earmark. I know one time he found buckets with hundreds of those lower earlobes, uh, you know. But anyway, problems, therefore, since it's inhumane, is you can't find a picture of it. Um, nobody does them anymore. And so I engaged the granddaughter, her first art commission. Uh, she's, <laughs> she's in eighth grade and takes art lessons and I thought Jesse could uh, maybe handle this and she did. You can see the cow at lower left and uh, you can see that you get the idea of the Jingle Bob earmark. So we, in, in, in lieu of a earmark, we created one. <laughs> so there's, that's what Jim Wild looks like. And if you and he had them altered both ears. And so with both ears altered, Jingle Bobs could be spotted at any Roundup herd or Craddock Corral. And when the Civil War started out in 1861, John Chisholm had one of the largest cattle herds in Texas despite being in business just a few years. State officials designated him a supplier of beef for Katrina troops, and they even gave him a, a rank a little bit later. And uh, so this role suited Chisholm perfectly because he had no interest in fighting a war, but he had a whole lot of cows. They all had a lot of beef to sell the soldiers. So starting late in 61, and then throughout 62 and into 63, about the midpoint of the war, Chisholm drove cattle to Vicksburg, Little Rock, and Shreveport. And he would just he'd go along the Red River and then he'd hang a left or just follow the river down the Shreveport depending on where it was headed. And he was paid $40 a head in Confederate currency. Well, the war's still going on. Confederate currency is still worth something. And so he promptly put that money to work purchasing more cattle or parcels of land. But settlers as well, there were Confederate deserters by this time out on the fringe of the frontier as well. And they began moving on to the rich farmlands of Denton and Tarrant counties. So by 64, Chisholm started driving herds onto the empty ranges of Coleman and Concho County. And that same year, Chisholm's 10-year partnership with Fowler expired. Fowler was no cattleman, so Chisholm paid him off with parcels of land that he had acquired in Denton County. He wanted to be his own operator. And his Coleman County range was 180 miles from Fort Worth, so he acquired a store and owned his first little community in Coleman County. It was uh, called Trickle, and it was near his ranch dugouts and corral. But he had to surround that ranch supply store with stockade, and he loopholed the store because they were hammered uh, by, by, they had to fight off Comanches, not to speak of Confederate deserters. You can see where it is, it's about 180 miles. But the Bolivar Ranch is about, it's about, it's not quite 20 miles north of Denton today, and then Fort Worth is down and to the left. And then, uh, and so the the only provisions nearby were in Fort Worth, 180 miles away. So you know, what's he going to do? He acquired the general store in in uh, in uh, uh, Trickle, and that became his ranch supply store. And people came in there and bought stuff from him anyway. So Comanches <clears throat> targeted Chisholm's horses. And later, so did Apaches in New Mexico. In Texas, Comanches once drove off the whole remuda, all the horses he had, except for five. They managed to keep their hands on five of them. So Chisholm and two of his guys <clears throat> took, went to Austin, and that's about as far below the bottom of the map as Fort Worth was. Austin's almost as far away as Fort Worth. 
So he went down there to buy a new horse there. That left two horses behind for the guys on the range. A few years later in New Mexico, Raiders stole all of a trail herd Bermuda, except for those ridden. He had four night hawks and they hit the thing at night and they ran off all horses and they had four horses left. Now Chisholm wasn't with this particular bunch. So they had to complete the drive and it's long drive. They had to complete that drive with those four horses. So one guy rode point, a couple other guys rode swing and everybody else walked mm -hmm. and uh, including the guys and drag, you know, imagine walking drag behind a bunch of cows and eating their dust and stuff. And it took them forever to finish that drive on foot. And they had to watch it because the longhorns are very ornery and they had to keep their six guns handy because uh, the longhorns would, were, would, would and were charging them. Um, one time he, a uh, pitcher was leading a herd into New Mexico and Apaches hit him and drove off that whole cow herd. And they didn't really want cows, they just butchered them all and, and left them to the carcasses. First herd that Chisholm drove into New Mexico, 900 Longhorns in 1867 were purchased by an Eastern firm for $28,000 in drafts. About the time they made the exchange, that firm failed and he didn't get a nickel. Mm -hmm. But he just, it was his nature just to take all of these things in stride and stride uh, and go on to the next, uh, hopefully, triumph. In 1866, Palapena County, and Palapena County is up in the northwest part of Texas. Palapena County uh, ranchers Charles Goodnight, the legendary Texas cattleman and Oliver Loving, famously made known to every cattle drive that skirted the northern edge of Chisholm's Coleman and Concho County range and they went down the Middle Concho River. And when they got to the headwaters of the Middle Concho, it was about 90 miles to the Pecos. And off they went. Uh, they drove all night, watered them during the day, drove all night, all the next day, all the next night, and then they started smelling the really alkaline water of the horse head of the, of the Pecos. But they got there and they showed it could be done and that's the beginning of the Good Night Loving Trail. And then they followed the river all the way up to the top of the map to Fort Sumner, which was the uh, reservation uh, headquarters of the Bosque Redondo Indian Reservation. They were paid $12,000 in gold for, uh, for part of their herd. And they sold the rest of it. Well, they said, wow, we're coming back. And so in 1867, the next year they came back twice and uh, came, came, brought two more herds up the Good Night Loving Trail. Well, they're going right by Chisholm's range, and he says, "Hey, what's going on? I need to, I need to get in on this." And so he did, and um, and so he followed him and drove it. And you know, there's all kinds of everybody I told I was doing this book. They kept saying, "Oh, Chisholm, Chisholm Trail." No, that was a guy named Jesse Chisholm, whose last name was spelled H O L M. Um, but and he was just he wasn't even a cattleman; he was a trader. <laughs> but there was a Chisholm Trail, believe it or not. And the, re the where it was, when you get to Horsehead Crossing, you'll notice there aren't any tributaries on the right or east part because that's the state plains. The lot of West Cut is just flat. But to the left or west, there are mountains, and that's why there's so many tributaries, and I've just drawn the major ones. And so here's all this wa fresh water coming in from the mountains. And Goodnight did not want to make all those river crossings. So he went up the right side, the east side of the river, and that may do with that old alkaline stuff in the Pecos. But good, uh, uh, but uh, Chisholm decided to go and cross all those rivers and get fresh water. And so that left-hand side in New Mexico, they call that the Chisholm Trail. That's the New Mexico Chisholm Trail. So in a sense, the Chisholm Trail thing was right. But good night. Uh, I'll tell you, in 1867, when Goodnight comes up there, that's the same year as the Chis as the, the, the real Chisholm Trail. And they're going north, the Texas cattlemen are going north to Kansas. Last year, I represented Texas at, uh, at uh, up in Kansas at uh, the 150th anniversary of the Chisholm Trail and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, he didn't want any part of that. He didn't want to go north. He wanted to go west. And he thought, and my future is to the west where we've got all those Indian reservations and con beef contracts and everything, the forts and stuff. I'm going that way. And that's that's what he did. Good night, hated that. He hated the, the, the whole river. It wasn't just that sorry water, but there were rattlesnakes everywhere. Uh, just, just all over the place. There was quicksand everywhere. 
the, the riverbanks were very steep and the cows would hurt themselves trying to get down to water and stuff. But it was, uh, good night said, the pathos, the graveyard of the cowman's hopes. I hated it. But alongside this treacherous river, John Chisholm soon built the West's greatest open range ranch. Now, Oliver Loving was slain, his partner, good night's partner, was slain by a war party in 1867. And you may know the story on this. He got, he got his arm shattered. He got a couple of wounds in his arm and his arm shattered. And by the time he fought the Indians off, uh, and set out on foot. The thing was getting gangrenous, and an army surgeon took it, took off the arm. And by the time his partner, Goodnight, caught up with him, you know, he was dying, and he asked Goodnight to take him back to Texas. If that sounds familiar, Larry McMurtry yeah. grabbed it. For, you know, he, 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 he appropriated the whole thing, but he changed it. You know, Gus got two errors in the leg. And then, uh, and then Tommy Lee Jones, playing the Goodnight character, had to take him back alone. Well, Goodnight was accompanied by 75 cowboys. So, <laughs> so that took, a, took a couple of <laughs> liberties. But anyway, uh, sure was a good story though. But anyway, um, uh, now Goodnight got all these contracts and he was really good at ran those things up. And he, he didn't have a partner. So he and Chisholm partnered for three years. And Chisholm is going back and forth and getting as many cows as he can to New Mexico. And he was really good at it. Good night bragged on him. He said, Chisholm was a great trail man. No one had any advantage over him as an old fashioned cow man. He was the best counter I ever uh, knew. He could count three grades of cattle at once and count them accurately, even if we're going at a trot. Chisholm soon grazed tens of thousands of cattle from just south of Fort Sumner, which had just been abandoned by the Army, uh, almost the Texas border. His range extended, as I said, a couple hundred miles along the Pecos River, but also 40 to 60 miles on either side. Uh, it, it covered millions of acres. So he established 20 cow camps uh, at, uh, at, at strategic points across his vast range. Most of them were two-room dugouts. There were two cowboys, and they bumped in one of the rooms and the danger of Indian theft was so great that the reason they had another room is they locked the horses up at night. And everyone comes, otherwise they'd, get, they'd be on foot. Uh, Chisholm later moved his ranch headquarters from Bosque Grande, that was his first headquarters, a kind of a rendezvous point. And he moved it down more toward the center of the ranch below the village of Roswell, which is no longer village, but anyway, he moved it down there to South, he called it South Spring Ranch the South Spring River, so-called, is only a few miles long. It's the shortest river I've ever seen. But boy, it is an artesian stream and it just gushes water uh, uh, to the, uh, into the, uh, the, the, the Pecos. Um, he, um, his jingle bob cattle multiplied exponentially on the New Mexico range. His herd soon totaled 80,000. And he's selling cows all the time, but they're still multiplying. Every time he looked up, he still had about 80,000. He employed more than 90 riders, including about 40 men uh, at, the, at a score of cow camps. There were constant cattle drives, including some along the same trail. Here's his deal. If he sold, say a couple of thousand head of cattle to some fort in Arizona or something, well, okay, just send Pitzer and take 2,000 head. But what if he sold seven or 8,000 head to a reservation? You, it's too many cows for the water and the grass that's available. So he'd take the first turn. And then a couple days later, he'd come Pitzer with another part of that, several thousand. And then some foreman would come a few days later with another one, and they just fought each other. And it was just drive, drive, drive. The cattlemen really were good at shaking hands over a deal. And that's all you get. There aren't, there are very few records of all these cattle deals and stuff. But I guess because they were selling the forts and the reservations, there's a 10 month period from July of 75 to, to May of 1876, 10 months, less than a year. And there were months, now this doesn't cover stuff they were selling in other directions, but every month they sent a cattle drive to Fort Bowie, Arizona, as well as larger herds every month to the San Carlos Indian Reservation. The aggregate deliveries, I added it up, add up to $221,722, that's in a 10 month period. Well, my publisher got curious. He's an old cowboy and he, he, he added it up and he said, in today's money, that 10 months of sales, 
total $4.6 million. Wow. And so that's why he was able to take losses in stride and stuff. He knew he was going to be doing okay. And so drive, 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 drive in every direction. And there was so much of that that uh, the, uh, the Chisholm Cowboys added a new verse to a famous cowboy ballad. When I get home, I'll sleep a week, and all those vows I make, I'll keep. I swear by rope and bridle rein, I'll never drive jingle bob cows again. They want to keep them. And you see, he was the biggest employer in Lincoln County. That was the thing. Lincoln County was the largest county in the nation at that time. Mm -hmm. It was the lower, the southeastern quarter of New Mexico, 27,000 square miles. And uh, went by living in it, and that's why he had such a such a deal going. He had that place all to himself for a long time. Late in 1875, he was needing some cash. He sold 60,000 head of cows to the livestock commission firm of Hunter and Edmonds for $319,000, and he owed them a lot of money too. So it it got him out of a hole. And then they turned around and paid him $5,000 a year to superintend. Um, the roundup and delivery of these herds. And it took them about three years to do it. And right off the bat, they said, okay, you gotta take some to so and so in Colorado. You know, we've already, and this, and it, it, it took about three years for that. And by that time, Chisholm's remaining herd, now he sold just about everything he had. And his remaining herd had grown back after three years to 30,000 head. Uh, doing roundups and trail drives, Chisholm often was on the range with his men. He, he either rode a mule for the sure-footedness if they were in the mountains to the west, or he rode a big roan called Old Steady. He always carried binoculars. He also carried a revolver. If you see the John Wayne movie, Big John in Chisholm is always wearing his gun rig. Well, Chisholm never wore a gun rig. Uh, what he did, he didn't like to wear it. So what he did, he wrapped it around his saddle horn, and it was right there where he, could, where he could reach it. And if he drove a buckboard, he had a Winchester. He also brought along his fiddle. He had been a really good fiddler since he was a, a youngster. And he played for impromptu cattle dances around the campfire. And he sometimes delighted the crew by breaking, breaking out a keg of whiskey. The vast unfenced Jingle Bob range was a wide, no fences, wide open target for rustlers. And uh, Chisholm, you know, when he got a chance, he supervised lynchings. One time there were no trees nearby, it was on the, Lano Estacado, the right side of the, the eastern side of the Pecos River. So why are you gonna hang him? Well, they got a they got a chuck wagon and they, they braced up the wagon tongue. And the wagon tongue had a big old iron ring on the end of it, and they slipped the rope through the iron ring and then they hoisted the guy up. And you know, you gotta drop a guy, break his neck, so this guy strangled him to death. And Chisholm didn't bother him a bit. On another occasion, three mounts were stolen from a trail drive Ramuda. Chisholm led a dozen riders in hard pursuit. And when they overtook one of the rustlers, and he loved describing this, and this is, well, I'm quoting We asked him no questions. Vegetation was scarce there, but we took the highest we could find and dragged him up till his head was in two inches of the limb, which meant he strangled to death. So the rustler goes through these wild contortions as he's gasping for air and everything. And then he liked to finish the story. He told us in the newspaper, guys, and everything. He said, the buttons of his clothing gave way. And when we left him, he was almost as naked as when he was born. And um, a little bit, there were up similar incidents. A little wonder his men began to call him Judge Lynch. During the murderous Lincoln County War, the Chisholm Ranch became a target of the ruthless Murphy Dolan faction. Chisholm became a partner in the Tunstall McSween store. Those were the two factions. And he aligned with Tunstall and McSween, who was a lawyer. And um, and so he opened a bank in their store. And if you go to Lincoln today, uh, there's a great big, the, the store is a great big museum. And it was in that store that uh, Chisholm operated his bank. but. Both of his partners got murdered in separate incidents and he started off, yeah, he thought what might happen. And so uh, Chisholm, who had sold off much of his herd, he took whatever herd he had left, he packed up his whole family, which was a lot of people around him, and they went to the Texas Panhandle for nearly a year, about 30 miles west of Tascosa, while the war settled and business, he had got killed and so forth. 
After the Lincoln County War, Chisholm erected the headquarters complex in South Spring that I told you was just magnificent. The long house, it was called, was 144 feet long, 144 feet long. The walls were adobe, but the roof was gabled with uh, wooden shingles. So shingles, windows, uh, carpets. He had axe mister carpets all through the house. And that's why he had a separate room for dancing. He didn't want those cowboys dancing on his carpet. <laughs> and uh, and uh, furniture. All of it had to be freighted in 200 miles from the nearest railroad. And he fine, did it, 4.6 million. <laughs> he had no money. So his room was a combination of office and bedroom. There was a heavy bedstead, a walnut desk, a safe, of course, and he had a big old dictionary, library style, on those, a big dictionary on a stand. Uh, and uh, that was for his business correspondence. He had chairs and a carpet. Extensive grounds were irrigated by the South Spring River. He imported hundreds of rose bushes as well as shrubs and other flowers. Two ponds were scraped out complete with an island that Pitts are named biblically, the Isle of Patmos. Chisholm had the ranch carpenter build two rowboats for his guests' amusement. And there were trees of all sorts, apples, peaches, plums, uh, pears, cherries, nectarines. Two rows of cottonwoods were planted. Now I first saw this ranch back in uh, the early 90s when I was doing another book about th this ranching, not about Chisholm, just part of it. And that Cottonwood Lane is still there. I saw it again just last year. And uh, he, he, he was a road just straight as a strain to the, to the house. The house is gone. But, uh, but that Cottonwood Lane is still there that he planted. He planted alfalfa. He had a bunch of uh, Mexican guys who worked for him and he planted alfalfa fields and stuff. His splendid frontier home was christened with a Christmas feast and an all night dance in 1880. The South Spring Ranch was a New Mexico show place. You gotta understand how undeveloped New Mexico was in those days. He loved showing it off. This is what I've done. He showed it off the newspaper men. That's why there's so many descriptions of it. Cattle buyers, tourists. He never knew who was gonna be at his dinner table, but unfortunately, he did not enjoy this for a few years. By 1884, he had one of those tumors grow on his neck and jaw, you know, those things. Man, what are you gonna do about in those days? With a premonition that he would never return, Chisholm left the South Spring Ranch and had surgery in Kansas City. You gotta remember, he did a lot of business back east. He had really fine business clothes and so forth, you know, $750 watch chain and everything. He goes back east, he doesn't know if he's gonna have surgery in New York or wherever they had it in Kansas City and uh, lost a lot of blood and stuff. It was a lengthy recovery, so he takes a train back to New Mexico. He's hoping to come home. Time he got to New Mexico, not to his home, but to New Mexico, that thing had grown back, just bam, just like that. It just almost exploded on him. And so he got off train, took an eastbound train back to KC. His doctors desperately sent him to take the waters, as the phrase went, at Eureka Springs in the Ozark Mountains of uh, Northern Arkansas. Uh, a railroad had just reached um, um, the, the Ozark Mountains at, at that point. Uh, in 1883, it's late the next year that Chisholm arrives at this fast growing resort of 66 named springs. None of the springs, of course, offered real help. John Chisholm died on the night of December 22, 1884. He had, his older, oldest brother was with him. He was 60. He had uh, James take his body by train to Paris, and he was buried on Christmas Day in front of a big crowd there. There was a, they had a little private cemetery where his parents were buried. He was, he was buried some very impressive thing. Let me just say one more thing. I gotta throw this in. He, I mentioned he never married. Um, he was a real flirtatious guy, and he he loved female company. And as he got older, he enjoyed really young girls who were around, I mean girls, but teenage girls who were around. He did not, there's nothing salacious about it. I should have never accused of anything like that. But um, I, I didn't get it. And so the whole <coughs> of chapter eight is about his <coughs> whatever with girls. And, and I, I did as I have done many times in the past. My, my understanding of psychology is about that deep. You know, more of an inch, an eighth of an inch or something. So I called Dorothy Bradley. Oh but she explains everything to me, you know, tells me all about it. I got it and I'm taking notes furiously. And, uh, and so then I put chapter eight together. 
And my sister, who didn't care anything about ranching or anything like that, she called me on the phone last night. I'm giving her a book. She said, I read chapter eight last night. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she'd like chapter eight. <laughs> Relationships. Thank you for coming. I, I so appreciate your presence here on National Library Week. We've got it started off. Good. Thank you. Thank you. be available afterwards if you'd like to obtain a book and have an autograph and there's refreshments at the back while you're on campus please take a moment and visit the gallery we still have a wearable art exhibit and beginning Wednesday I'm gonna give y'all an extra day show we're trying to get it the gallery turned around tonight but there's a good chance it won't be finished until Wednesday we have a new exhibit coming from Mid-America Arts Alliance on the Underground Railroad and it's a photography exhibit where the photographer has gone back to all of the known locations to show what they look like now in present day and then she has a lot of uh, historical information to go along with the, the photographs so come back and join us for that it'll be here until the end of May thank you again thank you.